Ready to get started? All right, I'm excited too. <laughs> I'm Helena Zinkham, by the way, Chief of the Prints and Photographs Division. Thank you for joining us for today's program with award-winning cartoonist Lynn Johnston. This talk is presented in connection with the library's new exhibit called Comic Art, 100 Years of Panels and Pages. The show considers how visual and narrative storytelling have evolved from the large panels and strips, small strips and newspapers, to graphic novels, independent comics, and of course, comics on the web. In both the unique original drawings and the published pages on display, you'll see the artistic skills of master artists as well as emerging talents. They've created some of the most famous funny, and frightening characters to appear in the comic world. And let's acknowledge right now, Lynn Johnston, you're on the master side. <laughs> All the works on display are from the collections of the prints and photographs and the serial and government publications divisions here at the Library of Congress. They'll be on view through September 2020 or you can check the show out online where it would live permanently on the web. You can please join me now in recognizing the collaborative curators and the exhibit director. Have you tucked yourselves in the back row? Okay, <laughs> alphabetically speaking. Uh, we also owe thanks to Sarah Duke. Go ahead and stand up. <laughs> Megan Hall's band, Georgia Higley, Martha Kennedy, and Betsy Nahum Miller. <laughs> I'm embarrassing them a bit by asking for the stand-up in that they will also help guide you to the exhibit after the talk finishes. All right, generous support, no exhibit is free. I'd like to acknowledge the Swan Foundation for Caricature and Cartoon as one of our major sponsors, and also the Small Press Expo they have made the exhibition possible. And finally, the Canadian Embassy for Lynn Johnston's presence today. When Lynn Johnston began her comic chronicle of the Patterson family way back in 1979, she drew upon her own life. Her strip, for better or for worse, still appears in over 1,600 papers in Canada, the United States, and other countries. More than 30 books are still in print. An original drawing featured in the exhibit uh, will highlight, for better or for worse, we'll be able to see the full technique that you use to pull off this 30-year achievement. And we're delighted to have really more than a dozen of your original drawings in the collection. Today's presentation will include a presentation demonstration of the process behind creating the strip such a special treat. But I think we'll also be gaining valuable insights into the comic arts in general. I'm hoping, too, that we will hear about that wonderful sheepdog, Farley. <laughs> Have you noticed the importance of dogs in the comic arts? In the early 1900s, so right at the beginning, Buster Brown had his mischievous pit bull terrier, Taj, he often gave the moral at the end of the Buster Brown tales. Charles Schultz brought us the iconic beagle Snoopy. I understand Mr. Schultz might have been one of your own heroes, yes. <laughs> and Lynn Johnston, you made us fall in love with Farley. So thank you all today. We're filming, so if you do ask a question, know in advance that your question will be part of that recording. Please welcome Lynn Johnston. Thank you. I have a, I'm wired, I think. Am I wired and, and loud and live? Well, I've done this talk a number of times, and every time I do it, I'm scared to death. And I see this room full of great people, and I've walked around and said hello, but my heart's still going boom, boom, boom. And I took my high blood pressure medication this morning, you know? I took it. <laughs> And at the age of 72, you kind of think that everybody's forgotten you. The strip is done. Life has changed. And, and yet, 
the rebirth of it in the, in the embassy here and running again for a second time is such an honor and such a thrill. And I would love to be able to continue doing it. I would, but stuff is falling off the bus. I can't see out of this eyeball anymore. So going downstairs, a stairwell just looks like gray to me, so I have to hold on to the banister as I go down, right? And my right hand shakes, so having a bowl of soup is like, you know, like with this. And you, you don't really think about yourself being old until you see a photograph, and then who the heck is that, right? And our buddies, we all see each other, and we talk, and we look like we did in grade five, and we all know each other the same. But then you see a photograph, you see yourself in the mirror, and you say, who the heck is that? And one day I was wandering around the, uh, the National Gallery in Ottawa, in Canada, minding my own business, and I was looking at a painting, and a man came up to me with a walker, and he said to me, you know they're making grilled cheese sandwiches down in the cafeteria? And I thought, that's a pickup line. No, no, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> so anyways, with age have come all my friends, and, um, and with age has come perspective. And I can look back at what I did and perhaps be a little more analytical. But I see myself differently now. So this is how I used to draw Ellie Patterson. This was sort of me. She was the hardest character to draw just because she was closely connected to me. But today, I look a little different. I would say that if I was to draw Ellie Patterson now, aka me, a little startling in the eyes, the eye bags, of course. And then there's the, the obligatory short haircut, you know. <laughs> and the underwire, and the, the wrinkles and the stuff that come with it. And, and then, of course, there's the dandruff and the other things that come with old age. So I think Ellie Patterson would look a little more like that. But you know what's great is that people will say, geez, you draw her so ugly. She's so ugly. Wait, you're much better looking. You say, well, if I drew her looking great, and people said to me, you know, the character in the strip looks really good, but you, mm, you know? <laughs> so, so drawing the character ugly was always really a cool thing for me to do. So I started drawing when I was really young, and all of you, I know this from artists in here too, and you start when you're very, very young, because you can't not draw. And you draw your fantasies, you draw the things that you're afraid of, you just draw, and for me to be sent home to my room, you know, it was fine with me because I had lots of paper, lots of pens, and I liked to draw. And I liked to read the comics. And one of the comic strips that just really inspired me was, uh, was um, Peanuts because Charles Schultz spoke for children, and he spoke without our vocabulary but with our common sense. And I, my grandfather and I did not get along very well. He was a very stuffy, upper-crust Brit and you could be seen and not heard, that type of thing. But the only time we really got along is when we read the comics together and I would snuggle up next to him and he'd criticize all the strips. But uh, Peanuts, he was particularly critical of because he said, children don't think like that. They don't speak like that. They don't use those words, but he was wrong. And as a little kid, I knew that he was absolutely wrong. So the comics kept me going. Mad Magazine kept me going. Archie kept me going. All the comics kept me going. And I didn't really think about making a living as a cartoonist when I was little. But I knew I would be an artist, and I knew that I would make my living drawing. And I used to analyze the comics, and one of the things that I, I discovered at a very young age was that with very few lines, you can have a lot of different expressions. And this is something you can do with your grandkids or your kids. You just take two dots and the letter C, and one small line. And with just those few elements, you can make a lot of different expressions just by moving the mouth, just by moving the mouth into different positions, moving the eyes into different positions. You can make different characters, different expressions, right? Just moving the nose a little bit. You can bring everything down to the bottom, carefully here, and you can make a baby out of this because the baby's head is so big, right? And you can change the expression of that baby. You can make the baby really sad, make the baby pensive, make the baby thoughtful. Just the little 
tiny little movements of where you put these lines. So when you're acting and you're drawing comic art, it's the subtle little elements that you put into your art, which people don't necessarily know that they're receiving. It's like a shorthand, it's like a, a signature. And so people will look and they'll automatically know that that sense is sadness or that sense is fear. And it's simple, tiny little elements like this, just simple little lines. So here we go here, that I can take this little guy here and Right? You know who that is? So, so you can take tiny little elements, and one of the things I guess that Sparky's work was so uh, important to me for was that with just these few elements, he could show all of this enthusiasm and fear and disappointment and angst and all of the stuff that he could show just with these few little lines. And that to me was absolute magic. So I copied his work, and I copied people out of MAD, and I copied Len Norris, who was one of the best illustrators ever. He was an architect, and he was Vancouver's best editorial cartoonist, and I copied his work. And I tell kids, go ahead and copy. It's fine to copy, as long as you take everything that you're learning and create your own stuff afterwards. So I, I used to draw everything that I could think of, and it was mostly people that I drew. And I got an awful lot of kick out of drawing. Well, my dad, for example, he had round glasses and huge eyebrows. And he had a nose with a lump on it like that. He was a typical British guy, right? Very sort of flat forehead and lots of hair. And my dad could play anything. He could play the banjo, he could play the guitar, he could play the piano. And my dad was, he, he should have been in vaudeville. He should have, he was born many years too late. He was one of these people who, he could dance, he could sing, he could act. He was part of a barbershop quartet and that harmony was just rich and wonderful. And these guys would stand in our living room and sing. And I would sit around the corner and listen. And, and my dad had the highest voice and he was always embarrassed by it, but he hit that note. And he would analyze movies, and he'd take me to movies, and he would analyze the plot. And he, then he would rent one of those old projectors, and he'd bring it home, and he'd rent the Keystone Cops, and he'd run it forwards and backwards, and he'd say, no gag is without effort. No gag happens without choreography. And so he would show, say, this old-fashioned rattle trap of a car moving down a highway, and the cops are coming out, and they go in as soon as the post goes by, the, the telephone pole. Then they open the door again, the post goes by, and he would run it slowly and he would say, they are almost killing themselves doing this gag. It's, it's not easy to do, watch how it's done. And he would run it backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And as he talked, he would use his body as language. I mean, I do it unconsciously and I, other people I see do it as well. Mike Peters, who does Mother Goose and Grimm, you can see Mike Peters 20 blocks away, just this big, and you know that it's Mike Peters because he's talking like this. Well, my dad talked like that. He used every part of his body and his facial expressions and all of that. So I was on record as a little kid, and I was learning all of that and taking all of that in. So my dad really, really was part of the inspiration as well. And um, he was also a cartoonist, and he, he used to... Uh, enjoy drawing uh, the guys that he uh, that he worked with and uh, and um, he made it easy for me to uh, to be different because I was not a happy little kid um, I wanted to die when I was six I would stand at my bedroom window and think could I kill myself if I went out this window and was hoping that I could and um, my mother was one of these people who was um, she, she would hit you before she talked to you. She was that kind of person. And she was also a very upper crust Brit. She, um, oh, you know, just talking about my mom is difficult because she was so talented and so capable. She could do anything, write anything, sew anything. And she was so frustrated that she did not have a career. She should have gone to university. She should have been a doctor. She sh because God help you if you got sick. Holy smokes, if you got sick, you had poultices and enemas and God knows what that you jumped. Mom, I'm fine, I'm perfectly fine. And you go to school with a temperature of 110 just so that your mother wouldn't try to cure you with something, right? 
But, you know, she was one of these people who was really unfulfilled. And so I had this goofy, comic, silly, musical dad and this brilliant, capable, wonderful mother who was a calligrapher and who was um, a book, I mean, she was a math whiz. I mean, she had so much going for her and was so angry and so upset that she was stuck at home in a house dress. And, uh, and I, I wonder if I could draw my mom. I, you know, I'm so... I, I very rarely drew her because she, uh, in the comic strip, I, I wanted to bring my dad to life again. And in the comic strip, I was able to do that. And uh, my mother always had, she was always in very much in control. So her hair was always tightly, tightly tied at the back here. And I, I remember her once saying that it got rid of the wrinkles, just having her hair so tight that she, you know, everything, everything was pulled back. So I used to, I used to draw all the things that I saw, all the things that made me laugh, and it, it did really save my neck because it wasn't until I got to school that I realized that I, that the talent that I had made me okay, that I didn't have to worry about not being loved and not being liked. And it was the teachers in my life that saved my bacon. And I know there are probably some teachers in here and you will never ever know what you've done for your students. You'll never know how close they felt to you or how much of a parent you were to them or how inspiring you were or how safe you made them feel because in that classroom, you're safe. You're safe, you're learning, you're there for a reason, you're getting something, you're getting energy and warmth and knowledge from your teachers. And my teachers saved my life, they really did. They made me feel like I had value. So in those days, this was the 60s, and I, I wore this because it was made in the 60s, and uh, macrame, right? Everybody's talking about macrame, and I think in the 60s, and I work in the 60s, and that was my time. So in the 60s, if you, if you slept with your boyfriend, you'd be out of the house. I mean, my mother was the type of person that would absolutely throw me out of the house, so I did the dumbest thing in the world. I had just started a job in an animation studio in Vancouver, which was my love. I really, I, I babysat for the guy who ran the studio. And whenever kids say to me, oh yeah, I'm too old to babysit, I'm not interested in babysitting, that's your very first job interview, that's your very first referral, right, is your babysitting people and your teachers. And so I was lucky I babysat for a guy who ran the animation studio at KVOS TV in Vancouver and he gave me my very first job in animation. And I was just starting to realize that through school I had the support of my teachers, through my dad I had comedy, through Jack, I had an introduction to animation, which was what I wanted more than anything. I'd gone to art school, but art school was fine arts. And those of us who wanted to go into graphics were called the hacks. And they would laugh at us, you know, and, but we were the only ones that made a living in the end. You know, everybody else is, is uh, you know, painting their ass green and making prints along the highway and getting a Canada Council grant to do it, but you know, there's no such thing as, uh, as sponsors anymore that uh, would hire you to paint a ceiling in their mansion. So it's very hard to get a job. So I was just starting to work for KVOS TV and I met a cameraman and I got married. What a dumb thing to do, honest to God. Anyways, this was, this was the 60s. And uh, one thing, first, let me, let me digress slightly. One thing about, one thing about being a cartoonist and being a little kid is that when you're really down and out and you're drawing to make yourself laugh, dumb and stupid is what you're going for. You're really going for dumb and stupid because the best, isn't it great when you find somebody who's dumber and stupider than you are, uglier or something, and you say, yeah, well, it's great to know you, great to know you. Man, is that a stupid person or what, you know? Do I feel good? I felt stupid this morning, but after talking to you, Jack, I feel great. I feel great. So... So, you know, the bigger the eyeballs, and the bigger the nose, and the bigger the mouth, the, the less space there is for cerebral stuff, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing, right? And so, and so I would, uh, I'd, lo I'd love to draw characters with great big noses, very little hair, you know, very little space here. And if you take your tiny little line, Look at all the different expressions you can make with one little line. So a, ca a cartoon is elastic, right? You can do anything with a cartoon. Don't ever put lips on a cartoon character because you can't stretch them anymore. So changing this around, 
You can make just all kinds of expressions with this. So anyways, going back to getting married, going back to getting married, I met this cameraman, right? And uh, his name was Doug, and he had great big eyes and a great big nose and lots of hair. And he, this was the 60s, so this was, <laughs> everybody had great big hair. So that's right. So this was, this was my first husband. I'll put a little dandruff here because I think that's appropriate. <laughs> and years later when I got a job as a medical artist, I realized that, you know, if you gave the orbs here, the upper mandible, the lower mandible, the zygomatic arch here, yeah, go back here. There isn't a whole lot of room for brain space, you know? <laughs> like, dandruff still exists, though. <laughs> Anyways, lots of fun, lots of fun with drawing. So I got married, I got married. And it was one of those things where, after the marriage broke down, my mother would say, well, we never liked him anyways, dear. We never liked him anyways. We'd say, well, why didn't you say so right at the beginning? I married the guy so I could sleep with him, so that you wouldn't throw me out of the house, and now you say you never liked him. If you told me that you didn't like him in the first place, uh, I probably still would have slept with him. Well, what the heck? <laughs> it was the 60s. It was the 60s, right? Weed was just happening in Vancouver, and I was happy with that. So got married and moved off to Ontario where um, he could get a job and I couldn't. I was starting to work in an animation studio and got out to Ontario and there was no way for me to get a job. And so, um, and Hamilton, Ontario is a really interesting place. It's, we, when we drove from the airport into Hamilton, I was missing the mountains of Vancouver. I really was missing the ocean and the mountains. And in the background, I could see this dark shape and I thought, there is a mountain in Hamilton, there is. And as we got closer and closer to the city, it was smog. That was, that would mountain, that dark shape was smog. And uh, you know, and afterwards I, the inhabitants would say, oh yes, it's a place where you open the windows so you can hear the birds cough, right? <laughs> so it was one of those places that was just, it was a really unattractive place, but suddenly coming from the West Coast, and a West Coast snob, right? British family, West Coast snob. I met some of the most wonderful people and doors opened for me everywhere. I would take my little graphic art studio suitcase around to all the different places and try to get little jobs here and there. And I saw an ad in the newspaper for, they wanted a graphic artist at the local hospital. So I thought, well, I'll stay up all night. I drew guts and heads and arms and skeletons and stuff like that. And I went in and I got this job. And it was the absolute best job in the world because my mom wanted to be a doctor and I've always been interested in medicine, never smart enough to get in, but really just could not believe my good fortune. And there at the university, um, we were given free reign. It was a medical teaching university and we were given free reign to go anywhere. As long as you were wearing a white lab coat, you could go into surgery. I mean, honest to goodness, today I think it's a lot more difficult to just go anywhere, but I would go into the morgue and I would go into surgery and I would take photographs and I'd be with the photographers. I also had to be with women who had been beaten because they needed a woman in the room. And so I saw a lot of people who had had terrible trauma that were, you know, being photographed for, you know, legal purposes and things like that. So it was a hugely different world and I was able to use um, some of the comic art that I had done, I was able to use some of the animation that I had done, and I, I felt that I had entered into a world that was not mine, but an opportunity that was beyond my belief. And remember I told you that I used to think about jumping out of my bedroom window and killing myself? Well, I went into the autopsy lab and I wanted to see a whole autopsy from beginning to end, just because I was curious, no, no other reason, but I could hear the saws from my studio, Zzzz, and I wanted to know what they were doing in there. So I went in, and the woman that they were working on was about 50, and she died of syphilis, of all things, and they wanted to see what in her body had been affected. So she was a pretty normal-looking person, and everything happened like clockwork. They, it's, you know what the Rice Krispie snack pack looks like? The old fat, you know, open here and open there. 
Rice Krispie snack pack. You open up this thing, you chop here, you chop there, you lift everything out, it goes onto a nice shiny table, they take it all apart, they cut pieces up, they're talking, they're having a Coke, they're talking about their kids and they're, what they're gonna do on the weekend. And there is this body that's open and it looks just like a beautiful canoe. It has that shiny blue sheen to it, that beautiful shape of just a canoe, this open body. And there over there is this material that makes you alive. And as I watched them cutting into this, I thought, the magic is out there. That there's, there's so many reasons to stay alive because there's magic that takes that material and turns you into you. What, you know, your facial expressions, your body language, your memories, your friendships, your, your capabilities, your intelligence, your everything that is you is out there because it's like taking the back off a radio or a television or opening up uh, your dishwasher, you know, the guy comes to fix your fridge. You open up the back of a machine and all the material is there, but what, what is it that plugs it into the wall and turns it into something that is useful and wonderful? And that is, it's a spiritual awakening for me. And I was so filled with the spirit of, of life and whatever it is that makes us us and the reason for living, that when I left the room, I felt like I was walking this far off the floor and it was because I'd seen what we were made of. You know, it, it's not just the, the great big eyes and, and the, the goofiness and the, you know, trying to, trying to make people laugh and, you know, it's all of that, but more than, more than that, it's, it's energy that comes from somewhere else and you can call it what you like and you can go to the temple and the church and the, the, the shul and, and the ashram, wherever you go to get that energy, but there it is. And for me, it was so affirming. And when I came out of that autopsy room, I met one of the first young medical students walking down the hallway and he said, is this your first autopsy? And I said, yes. And he said, isn't it wonderful? And I thought, it is, it is. We're all so afraid of what makes us us but it's wonderful. So when I was working for McMaster University, all of that was, was exceptional for me to be so connected to the medical students, so connected to what was, uh, what was going on in terms of um, electronics and camera work and uh, film and um, um, educational systems. We were producing slide tape presentations and that sort of thing. And I would work with the doctors doing their lectures. And one of the doctors who was doing epidemiology and biostatistics realized that his work was pretty boring. It was all, you know, diazo slides and lettering and numbers and things like that. So his dad was a cartoonist and Dr. Sack had asked me to do cartoons for his lectures, which I did. And uh, the students loved it, and he loved it. And we started doing nothing but cartoons for, for the epidemiology department. Well, he got into trouble because the doctors above him would say, this is not a joke. This is a medical school. We don't want to have comic art. So being a biostatistician, you know, statistics, he decided to have a control group and a group that learned from the, the cartoons. And the cartoon group answered more questions correctly. And so all of the doctors were asking me then to do cartoons. So I went from drawing serious medical illustration to uh, comic art for all of the doctors at McMaster. And it was just a fabulous opportunity for me to, um, to do everything that I loved, everything, to learn about medicine, to learn about life, to learn about all of these different chemicals. And, and, and another thing that I was given that was an absolute uh, it was an absolute um, honor to be given was I had the opportunity to work on uh, fetal development and I was given many fetuses, little ones, to draw and to work on and some of them were opened to different areas of their, of their development. And again, I had that same sense, I had never had a child at that point, so I, I wasn't as connected as I would be later on. But that gave me the same sense of reverence and awe for our development. And I just want to tell you one thing which I think is in incredible. When the baby is developing, the, the, the bowel is the biggest part really of your body. I mean, it's a huge amount of stuff there. So where does it go? Is this tiny little bud, is this little beanie is developing? and it goes out into the umbilical cord in a great big loop. And it goes out and out and out and out and out and out. And then it has to reform itself 
twist itself, come back out of that umbilical cord back into the baby's belly. And it has to be done at the right time, at the right space, exactly right. And other things, parts of the heart and parts of the lungs and all of these things have to happen right on time. Isn't that a miracle? And you don't think about it until you look at it in terms of all these little moving parts and how it grows and how it develops. And, you know, we take things so for granted that any one of us that's born with all our functioning parts is a miracle, right? It is an absolute miracle. So I was filled with um, miracles when I worked for the medical school. I absolutely filled with mir miracles. And I think I had to be that way in order eventually to do a comic strip because a comic strip touches everything. If it's going to be something that touches everyone, it has to touch everything. So for me, um, getting this opportunity was pretty incredible. And I started by doing cartoons about, about pregnancy uh, for, for my doctor. And uh, th this is what, ha what happens when you're expecting a baby. You go into the doctor's examining room and you have to go, you know, once uh, every little while and then closer to the date, you're going every week and all that kind of stuff. And they go play golf and leave you to look at this empty ceiling, right? And you're, you can't go anywhere. You can't go for a coffee. You're half dressed and all that. So I said, Murray, why don't you put something on the ceiling for us to look at? And he said, you're the cartoonist. I challenge you to do cartoons for the ceiling of my examining table, of my examining room. So I did. And by the time Aaron was born, I had 80 some odd drawings. And shortly after, uh, and, and you know, I had the baby and life went on, but I was married to, I was married to this guy, right? I was married to this guy who actually turned out to be just probably a, a he was, he was, let me, let me start again. I'm having too much fun with that. I need to, I need to enjoy this. I need to enjoy this. So, so by then, he was starting to look a little tired because he drank an awful lot. So starting to look a little tired. And he would come home from, from work and I'd have this little baby and you know what little babies are like, they take all your time. You're nursing them, you're cleaning them, and if you get a chance, you'll do the dishes, you'll clean the house. And he would come home from work and say, what did you do all day? I'm paying for everything and you do nothing. What do you do all day? And he said, well, the kid's clean and he's healthy and he's alive and, it, you know, the dinner's on and, you know, yeah, but, you know, I'm paying all this money for, for what? You know, you're not earning your keep here. So, you know, life was really not easy and I was this, you know, kind of a little waif of a kid and I didn't stand up for myself much. See where you can put these lines. So my baby was born and I had been drawing cartoons for my obstetrician and one day um, my husband left me for a voluptuous script assistant at the television studio. I used to say I hope the four of them live happily ever after. Like she had massive boobs, you know, and it was just, four of them live happily ever after. And people say, well, how can you joke about stuff like that? But that's what, that's what survival is. It's about laughing at stuff that, that really is depressing. I can tell you a funny story about that. This, the doctors, the young doctors that went to McMaster, uh, there were 20 of them to begin with, and we all got to know each other pretty well because I was a graphic artist there, and I'd have to work, and I went to the lectures with the students and dissection and all this stuff. Anyways, I met one of them in Whitehorse the, uh, in Canada. There's this, you know, in, almost in the Arctic, the Yukon, right? And I went to, my, my partner is a musician, and we went to, to visit some of his musician pals, and in walks Dr. Dave, and he's one of the medical students. Well, he's the only surgeon in Whitehorse. And I said, Dave, you gotta have some funny stories. Well, he had two funny stories, and I'll, fast, I'll tell you one of them. One of them is a guy is chopping his, his firewood, and he chops off his thumb. His dog eats the thumb. He cuts open the dog, gets the thumb, drives to the, to the hospital, and asks Dave to sew it back on again. And Dave says, you know, it's kind of chewed up and munched. I don't think I can do that. So he, he just puts everything back, and, and the guy goes home, gets terribly drunk, really upset that he killed his dog, and, and, and he chops off another finger while he's doing his, yeah. So this stuff happens in the north. The other story, which I thought was cool, yeah. I mean, who needs them, right? You've got lots, you've got 10, you know, you don't need them all. You don't need them all, right? And so, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, 
sorry. Um, my partner's lost this part of his finger. He's a guitar player, so he can't flip the board bird, but he can still play the guitar because he was determined. The other funny story from Dave is that this woman, and this is apropos of me, the four of them live happily ever after. This woman had had a terrible divorce, and she came in, and she asked him to remove her implants, and then she sent them to her ex-husband because she said, he wanted them. He can have them. It was the only thing about me that he really liked, you know, and I thought... <laughs> Only in Whitehorse, only in Whitehorse. <laughs> so what happened was that I was, I was on my own. I, uh, my ex had left me for Rose, the lovely voluptuous script assistant, and I was on my own. And I got a phone call, and it was my doctor. And he said, I'd like you to come over to my house, kiddo. He said, what are you doing tonight? Bring the baby, have dinner. My wife is just cooking up. And I thought, wow, you know, how often does your doctor? I mean, doctors are important people. And, you kind of feel subservient, you know, and a little nervous around them, and, and uh, except for some of them that were idiots, but um, <laughs> this one, this one was really cool. So I went to his house, and his wife opened the door, and I went in, and Murray was sitting on the floor with a bottle of champagne, and he had all the cartoons that I had done for him from the ceiling above the examining table, and he said, kid, you got a book. And so he talked me into doing 101 cartoons, and I did a little book called David We're Pregnant. My husband's name was Doug, and I didn't like the name. So um, I did this little book, and it really did well. And I did two other little books, and they really did well. And the three little books were sent by a publisher in Minneapolis, and I have to graciously thank the United States for seeing something that was possible. I had tried to get things done in Canada, and I think they're far more analytical, and they want you to be they want you to be a success before they will invest in you. But in the States, I think there are a lot more people who are entrepreneurs and they will say, geez, there's potential here. Let's try her out. So I was given a wonderful opportunity by Universal Press Syndicate. They sent me a 20-year contract to do a daily comic strip based on family. And in the meantime, I had met my second husband. So it's funny how, I mean, at 72, I look back and it's, it's like the films that dad ran back and forth fast and slow and fast and slow that all these things that happen to you in your life, you know, you pick it here and pick it there and can't put it in real order, but there it is. And so um, I, had, I had been up at the airport looking at the small planes because I love to fly. I love to fly. Cartooning gives me the chance to fly. My imagination allows me to fly. When I was a little kid, I would roll up in a blanket and pretend I could fly. So here I was with my baby on my backpack, up at the airport, looking at these tiny little airplanes, thinking, who owns these airplanes? Who, who, who can fly one of these? And a little airplane landed, and the pilot got out and walked over, and we started talking. And he said, well, if you like to fly, do you want to go to the next airport for a hamburger? I said, you betcha. And so my baby and I piled into this little airplane. We flew to the next airport for hamburger. And I had been talking to a friend who was a psychologist, a woman, and I said, how do you know when a man is right for you? How do you know? And she said, he just smells right. Well, it was aftershave and afgas, af, you know, avgas. And that, that smell was just perfect for me. So I married Rod Johnston, who was in dental school. I was one of his first patients, and, uh, and I learned an awful lot about dentistry, and I learned all kinds of things about, uh, you know, trying to set up a practice and all of this stuff. And, and I was enthralled because he could fly. He could fly. And, and this little magic carpet was there, and he wanted to go live in the Arctic. He wanted to work in the native communities up there. He wanted to provide a service in the north. He wanted an airplane, but he wanted to have a, a job that he could afford an airplane and use it wisely. So he wanted to buy a little airplane, have his dental degree, and work in the Arctic villages. And I thought, I'd have to sell my house leave my, you know, by then I had, uh, I had a lot of clients. I was working freelance from my house, plus working for the hospital, because I had the baby, so I needed to, you know, change from full-time work. And I'd have to give all of that up to go to the Arctic to work. And I thought, little house on a beautiful treed street with solid friends and good work, flying to the Arctic in this unknown, I'll sell the house. <laughs> so... We put the house up for sale. He was just graduating from, art uh, from, from dental school, and I got this 20-year contract in the mail. And I was shocked because, I mean, you can be funny every so often, but to be funny every day for 20 years is really, really 
daunting. But I had some chutzpah. I was, by then, I no longer wanted to jump out of a window. I was filled with good stuff. I had a lot of confidence. And so I thought, maybe I could do this. It'd be foolish not to try. So on packing boxes, as we're moving, I sent 20 cartoons to Universal Press Syndicate, and they did send me a 20-year contract, which I watched my hand sign because I didn't, I didn't have a lawyer who could help me read it properly. I had no idea what I was signing, but it was 20 years worth of work, so I, I figured, okay. So by the time the contract was, was, was done and the house was sold, by then I'd had a second baby. You know, the Keystone Cops film, running back and forth. So here we were going up to Lynn Lake, Manitoba. I said, if we're going to go to the Arctic, I want to go to a place where I, there's an airport and where I can have a house. I don't want, he was going to live on a train and travel by train through the Arctic and into these areas. And I said, no, I, I would really like to live where I can, I can have family when his mom and dad lived in this little town called Lynn Lake, Manitoba. Well, that's as far north as you can drive in Winnipeg, which is in, in Manitoba, which is right in the middle of Canada. So if you think about the Hudson's Bay and then James Bay as a little dimple that comes off the bottom, we were right at the level of James Bay and Churchill, but on the Manitoba, on the Saskatchewan-Manitoba border. So it was north of 56. The temperature would go down to 50 below in the winter. It was a really interesting place to live. You, you live in a place where it's so small. Like there was something like 800 people in the town. And it's so small that every, everybody knows you immediately. They know everything about you. And I had never lived in a tiny town before. I moved from Vancouver to Hamilton, where you could hear the birds cough. And suddenly, here we were in this tiny Arctic community. And for me, at first, it was a rush because I like adventure. Holy smokes, I'm in this place. There's no trees. Ah, there's a mine. There's, no, you know, there's nothing here. Isn't this great? Isn't this great? It took me six months before I was, get me out of here. Get me out of here. So the first, the first day after we'd sort of moved into this house, I went down to a grocery store just to get some groceries. And I'm in line up with a bunch of other people. And the woman at the till, at the counter, was terrible. Move on, move on. Don't start talking. I don't have all day. Do you want that or not? If you don't want it, put it away. It was one of these Arctic villages. If there was one rotten green pepper, there were three ladies fighting over it, right? So this was a little Arctic grocery store. So I'm in line waiting and waiting, and this woman was horrible. When I finally came up, she says, who the hell are you? Where are you living? Are you living down on Pine Street? Okay, all right. How much do you want? Do you want to pay cash? Do you want it delivered? What do you want? And I thought, what? So I paid the money, and I went outside, and the woman in front of me was putting her baby in a carriage and getting her stuff organized. And I walked out, and she'd been treated like this, too. And I said to her, what's with that woman? Anyways, I got home, which was like a two-minute walk, and my phone was ringing. And it was Lena from the grocery store. And she said, well, you were talking to my sister-in-law. Watch what you say in a small town. <laughs> so I learned real fast that in a small town, you watch your P's and Q's. Mind you, there was an awful lot of hanky-panky going on in the wintertime because there's not a lot to do, right? So it's a place where you could steal a man's wife, but you don't touch his wood pile. <laughs> you don't. So uh, there we were in Lynn Lake, Manitoba, and my husband looked an awful lot like this. Good-sized nose. You can see my hands are starting to, to shake. So that's what happens. That's why I don't draw the strip anymore. So he looked an awful lot like that. I was changing. I had my hair tied back in a, in a bun and uh, looked sort of like this. My son Aaron was five at the time. He led a walkout in school. He didn't like what was going on. And he organized all the kids in grade one to come be, you know, to, to line up behind him. I'm going to draw a better picture of him than that. And uh, he said, this is, this is a walkout. I'm, I'm, you know, anybody who's not having any fun. He'd seen a walkout on TV. And uh, he said, anybody who's not having any fun, line up behind me. And so most of the class did, and he led them outside, and the teacher caught him and said, what the heck are you doing? And he said, we're going outside. We're not having any fun. And she said, well, you can't do that. And he said, well, we had a vote. She said, this is not a democracy here. <laughs> this is, you head back into that class. 
Anyways, that little episode was a play in that town. The teachers got together and they made a play about the walkout. It was that kind of town that, that stuff happened. People made their own fun. They made their own clothes. They made their own movies. They made their own dinners. I mean, the thing was that we would have to, we would all invite each other for, for dinner to each other's houses. But the thing was that you had to make something you'd never made before. And some of these dinners were disastrous and some of them were wonderful. And we didn't go online. We would try to find things, you know, in the li there was a library that had like 11 books. All kinds of crazy stuff went on in that town. So what, I, what was great about this tiny town was that here I am signing a contract to do a 20-year comic strip about a family that is supposed to be for better or for worse. The editors said, we want something that's going to rival High and Lois and Blondie and uh, the Family Circus and all the strips that are done by men that are kind of pleasant and sweet. And we want the real deal. We want what's going to really happen. We want the scrape the dog food off the dish. We want that wet diaper. We want everything that is real in a family. So when you move into a small town, and by then, little Katie was born. You can see all these characters look pretty much the same. And the characters look the same because cartooning is your signature, right? All of us, all of us who do comic art, um, our work, we might do similar uh, material, but we all have, um, we all have, oh no, that's April. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so my, my daughter, I, I wanted, she had the dark hair like that, and so I gave her the curly hair, right, because I didn't want her to be teased at school. So, so Elizabeth looked like this when I was first. See, it's been so long since I've drawn these characters, I forget how to draw them. So, but, you know, so the, the kids were tiny. Uh, we just started out. We had a new dental clinic that was above the, the grocery store where, where Lena worked. And Lena eventually became a good friend. I have to tell you, she was one of the most outspoken, crazy, lovable people. But she was noisy and mean. And if you got past that, you were fine. But what, what happens in a small town is you get to know everybody. You get to know the drunk who's asleep in the, in the you know, store front entrance. And you get to know the, the woman who's widowed and the man who's dying and the kids who are troubled at school. And our house was in the middle of town. So a lot of kids would come past my house and get food and get clothing and get uh, warm winter scarves and things like that because at the other end of town was a tent village where a lot of people lived in just hand to mouth. And so the kids going to school, some of them didn't have any food. And so um, my house was right in the middle and they knew that my house was a pretty safe house and I had a big backyard and the, I had a, a door that opened on the, the lane and a door that opened on the front uh, street. And the kids would come up the lane and the kids would come to my house and they would come mostly for clothing. They would come for hats and scarves because either they'd been taken from them or they'd lost them or they didn't have any. But at 50 below, a little kid who's walking six blocks home is going to need to cover their face and their hands. And so I had a great big box of extra coats and scarves and hats. And my kitchen was always ready for extra people to come by. Um, my daughter, uh, I said to my son one day, and he's 46, I said, what do you remember most about Lynn Lake and the little school you went to? And he said, your lunches. <laughs> you made, the, your lunch was my happy place. When I got to open my lunch, all the other kids would go, ooh, right? So Katie said, you know, I had those great lunches too, but there was a kid there who had sugar sandwiches, and he made his own sandwiches every day. And it was always a sugar sandwich, a right white bread. And she said, they were so good. She said, I used to get all this vegetables and you know nice food at home, but the sugar sandwich to me was heaven. And years later, she met this guy who was now working in Toronto. And he said to her, your mother fed me all through school. If it hadn't been for your lunch, I wouldn't have had a meal during the day. Your lunch was my meal. And, and she said, I just thought I was getting sugar sandwiches. you know." But it was that kind of town that there would be some very well-paid people who worked at the mine and some very, you know, people who were just really struggling at the other end of town. So because I got to know all of these people, I got to really care about them and see both sides. 
And at first, I was thinking that Ellie would have this nemesis. She would have this neighbor, Connie, who had it all. Ellie is like my mother, forced to live at home and have, you know, all these aspirations, but she's stuck with the children and she grumbles about, you know, housework and whatever. And if only she could do this and if only she could do that. And her neighbor would have it all. She'd have no children and she'd have a great job and always talking about where she was going and what she was doing. But living in a small town, I realized that nobody's all bad, nobody's all evil. And when I, I, I sometimes do talks to kids in, in elementary school, and the kids love monsters, right? They love to draw evil, gooey monsters and things like that. And I think, when you think about Alien as he's oozing his way into the corridor of the spaceship to eat people and slime everything, what does he do on the weekend? You know, what does he do? And he got to have a few days off, put his feet up, watch a, you know, a show. You know, what, what if he has an itch that he got to go, you know, man, I've been putting that off. i go, got to go see somebody about that. You know, what's his other life like? And they say, gee, is that, you know, and then they'd all talk about, well, what does Godzilla do on the weekend? What if, you know, what does Tarzan do when he's not swinging around? I mean, it's the other side. And you can see the other side when you go to a small town. And that, to me, really made the difference. Because everything you saw in For Better, For Worse, which started September, of 79, and this is the 40th year, this is 40 years afterwards, right? And it's still running. And um, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's an absolute amazement that it's still going, but there it is. But I wouldn't have been able to do what I did if I hadn't lived in this tiny little town. And the, the town actually closed down. It, uh, the mine closed and everybody had to leave and it was heartbreaking to leave this little town. I never would have wanted to live there for the rest of my life, but I felt cocooned and comfortable and cozy there. And there's a certain arrogance to living in, in the far north. You, you really feel as though you have, uh, you've escaped to something that nobody else will understand or, or imagine. And um, I can connect that too to working in Peru. Uh, a couple of friends here, uh, um, uh, Dr. Jim as a, as a psychiatrist, and I wondered how does psychiatry work when you're in a desperate situation and all of these people need health care, and um, to tell somebody that they're okay, that they're going to be okay, that faith is there, that there's the magic, that there is a lifeline that you can plug into this other energy that will save you really from yourself and, and from whatever is around you. You just need that faith to keep on going. And so I had that and, um, and I had 40 years of writing material that went out to millions of people and I felt connected to them too. I felt as though there was a lifeline between me and all of the people that read my work, the letters that I got, the, 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 you know, the, the well-wishing, the gifts, the things that came back, and it was a mutual connection between me and all of these people. People sometimes say, what is the best story you ever did? And I did two stories that resonated, and one was a story about a gay character. My, my brother-in-law is gay, and one of my very, very closest friends on the planet was a comedy writer for the CBC in, in Toronto, and he was so small and so feather-like that he played Peter Pan for many years at the theater. And he used to complain about this wedge that they had him sitting on that could never be padded enough that they would fly him around the stage on this little moon-shaped arc, right? He was so tiny, and, and he wouldn't hurt a fly. He was the funniest guy you ever saw, and he was murdered for his bicycle and his stereo. He was gay. And he had a big heart, and he met this kid who did down on his luck, didn't have any money, didn't have any food. He gave him 40 bucks and said, go get yourself something to eat, and there's a hostel around the corner there where you can stay the night for 20 bucks, so that'll give you tonight. Well, the kid followed him to his apartment and went out and bought a knife with the 40 bucks, went back to Michael's apartment, rang the bell, and when Michael opened the door, he slit his throat and he took his bicycle and his stereo. So for a bicycle and a stereo, this fabulous comedy writer who made everybody laugh uh, died. And the attitude of the police at the time was, well, there's one more predator off the street. We're not going to look into this too seriously. And the poor guy who, you know, the poor victim with the knife, that poor kid, he's, you know, just a street kid, we'll, we'll help him. Well, Michael's partner died of a broken heart. He worked for four years to try and get justice for this awful murder. 
And it's strange that the night Michael was, Michael died, I phoned his apartment just to say hello. And nobody answered. And I called Paul, his partner, who lived in a different building, and I said, um, what's going on? Where's Michael? And he didn't know. And that was the night he was killed. So there's energy out there, right? There's energy that pulls us together that makes us magically connect and we don't really realize. Well, you can't realize it. I think we're not allowed to realize it. But that connection with me and Michael, I thought, when I had this comic strip and I had 2,000 papers, and I wanted to do a story for Michael because I thought, it's about time. So I said to my editor, whose name is Lee, can I do this story if I do it carefully and well and if you edit it? And he said, you'll lose some papers for sure. Well, I, I wrote this story. I was willing to lose the papers. He figured I'd lose about six. And the story started to run, and it was just a gentle, easy story, and it was ran for four weeks. We told all of the people who, the editors, that we would provide alternate material if they wanted it, but this was sto a story that was going to run. And I could not believe the backlash that came. It was just, it was a phenomenal situation in which Michael's very best friend, Lawrence, who lived next door, um, I can't even remember how to draw Lawrence. Anyways, I know that he, uh, his dad was uh, was from South America, and uh, I had to make all of this story up of how how this dark kid could uh, be living with this mom next door, and uh, I looks a lot like Michael. Anyways, so <laughs> I, I, that's the problem, right? Because these signatures kind of dissolve after a while. If you haven't drawn them for a while, it's really hard to draw them. So I did this story, and my phone rang from morning till night. We got seven, I don't know how many, 3,000 letters, and um, most of them I answered. If they, were, if they had made sense, I would answer them, even the negative ones, but some of them were so horrible. There were death threats. There were uh, you know, phone calls from the most incredible people saying the most incredible things. But I found out that the people, the, all of the editors of the, all of the newspapers have to be fairly open-minded and they have to see things from different points of view. But if you're a small editor, a small newspaper in a small town, you're available. You can go into the Tim Hortons and have a cup of coffee and someone will come in and, and accost you and accuse you of printing something that they don't like. So all of the editors who were available were being bludgeoned by naysayers as well. So I got phone calls from them and I met wonderful editors, wonderful people who would say, I can't run your strip. My children are being beaten up at school. My dog was spray painted yesterday. My house windows were egged. I can't run the story, but I agree with you. So I was surprised by that because I thought any newspaper could print anything that was appropriate, but apparently not, not in many small towns. And these were all over the states, I got no complaints from anybody in Canada, really, except for Halifax. The Halifax Herald dropped my strip and never spoke to me again. You know, so something going on in Halifax. I don't know what it is, but I think the rest of the Canadians were busy watching hockey and staying warm, and you know, just it was just a story. But I am, I am proud of that story, and um, a lot of people wrote to tell me that they had, um, they had spoken to their mom for the first time. I, I, I actually brought some of the. Uh, some of the stuff here. Okay, so um, thank you for your story about Lawrence and for better or for worse. Because of it, I've been able to talk to my daughter. We'd not spoken for three years, and I mean I have not spoken to her. Perhaps we can salvage the future. Thank you for helping me to understand. And this one, what gives you the right to talk about something disgusting and unspeakable on the comics page? Our son is gay, and to me, he is lower than dirt. He's not welcome in our house and neither is your comic strip. I think one of the most hurtful letters came from a woman who said, I've just taken you off my refrigerator. You know? So here's a story from a young man, and I wish that he'd signed his name because I would have written him a great letter. He said, thank you for your profound series about the plight of Lawrence and for better or for worse. As a gay teenager hiding in the refuge of his closet, I was deeply moved by the ongoing drama. I hear homosexuals being bashed from myriad people all around me who, of course, don't know that I'm gay, including my parents, younger brothers, certain friends, and parochial teachers, and it hurts. I cut out each of the scenarios and keep them clandestine and safe, buried at the bottom of a desk drawer, concealed from prying eyes. It's good to know that I'm not universally despised and that I have value as a human being. I've rejected family and religion, but it renews hope in me to see that not every member of society loathes me. Thank you again. 
This was a letter from California, but I've since heard from many people who felt that way. So the other, <laughs> and, and that to me meant that, meant more to me than the laughs, you know, like a comic strip is wonderful because you can make people laugh. And when I wrote something funny, uh, I, recently I was just going over them again and there's a Christmas situation where John is complaining that the Christmas tree stand that Ellie has just bought from Custer's Cash and Carry is a piece of junk and it's not going to work. And he says, why didn't you get another one? She said, well, I, it was Custer's last stand. Right? <laughs> Terrible, horrible puns. I love that. It make people laugh. But to make people think and to make people talk was even better. So the other story that I did that, that people tend to remember is the story about Farley the dog. Well, Farley was really a wonderful character. And uh, he was based on an old English sheepdog that we had years ago. And he was big and lumbering and stupid. Dumb and stupid. Looked a lot like the husband. <laughs> Anyways, you know what's interesting is my first husband is 85 years old now. He's quite a bit older than I am. Well, not much, I'm 72. But he wanted to get together and just talk. And he said, can we be friends? Can we please be friends? And he's gone from this young, strapping, athletic guy, you know, hairy guy, to this tall, skinny, gaunt, yellow guy with a walker. And talk about that Keystone Cops movie, holy smokes, whew, back in time. And when I look at him, I see the young guy that I married. And holy smokes, here he is with a walker. And I put my arms around him, and I said, you bet. <laughs> we could be friends. Yeah, you know. So anyways, Farley the dog was a wonderful character because he, you know, he was, he could be a fantasy. He could be something that, that I could have fun with and stretch and play with. And yet the characters had all started to grow up and they grew up and they changed because I couldn't keep them young. I wanted at first to keep everybody the same age, but I couldn't keep them young. And because my own kids were growing up with new vocabulary and new friends and new ideas and new insights, how could you keep that out of the strip? So without my wanting to, everybody grew up. And it kept me from licensing anything. I mean, if I wanted to license April as a baby, for example, to Pampers, by the time the contract was signed and the graphics were done and the product was on the counter, she'd be three years old in the strip. So it was impossible for me to, to do any licensing. But this character had some possibility that way. This character was a real, uh, a real interesting imaginary guy, but he had a lifespan. So my sister-in-law, who's a veterinarian, said, you know, you gotta, you got to let him go, but make him go a hero. Because as a veterinarian, you know, her job a lot of the time was to end a pet's life. And she, she said, I just hate it. I just, it just breaks my heart. So have him go naturally and as a hero. So I wrote the story about Farley going down the hill with little April, and April's disappointed that she didn't get to go on a trip with the parents on a boat, and she has a toy boat which she puts into the stream. It's springtime, the stream is running hard and fast, she loses the boat, gets into the stream, and Farley the dog jumps in and holds her head above water till they can get her out, and he dies of exhaustion. He's an old dog, and he dies on the riverbed in, in Elizabeth's arms, and it's very, uh, you know, beautifully crafted. That's the one thing, they call us creators and you can control everything. You know who's going to live, who's going to die, who's going to get married, who's going to get a zit. I mean, big things and little things, you control them all, but you can't control real life, right? You can't control real life. So there was a certain amount of, you know, arrogance to being able to do this story. So anyways, Farley the dog died and before I did the story, I was telling Charles Schultz, I'm going to do this story and he said, you can't kill the dog. You can, that dog is an iconic dog. It's a signature piece. You can't kill the dog. And I said, but I have to. It's, you know, he's 13 years old. He said, if you kill that dog, I'm going to have Snoopy hit by a bus and everybody will <laughs> care about Snoopy. He's going he's gonna to go into the hospital. He's going to be sick. And everybody will read my stuff and they won't care about your dumb story. <laughs> so I didn't tell him when I was going to do it. And I wrote the story and I submitted it. And he was blindsided. He couldn't believe that he was reading the story. And he phoned me up and he said, that stupid little girl. What was she doing going down there alone with a boat to the river? That stupid little girl. And I thought, you really are part of the comics. He used to say, if you want to know me, read all my characters. Read my characters, because that's me. So, you know, for him, it was, it was a shock. 
But what happened when Farley died was, I mean, you work eight weeks ahead of the deadline. So eight weeks for the Sunday colored page, six weeks ahead of the deadline for the dailies. Always has to be that far ahead because they're sending your work to Guam and, you know, Australia and whatever, and it has to be colored. So they'd like that big, long deadline. Well, you don't know what the headline is going to be in the newspaper when that strip runs because it's eight weeks back, right? Well, the day that Farley died was the day of the Oklahoma bombing. And everybody was raw with emotion. Everybody was upset. I got letters from people who said, I cried all the way to work on the subway. I mean, but they were crying for other reasons. I mean, it was shocked everybody. So you have no way of knowing whether what you do is going to land on a good day or not. So that was something that I think probably has made his disappearance a little more memorable. But I didn't want to lose the dog. You're going to have to tell me when it's time to quit. Somebody's going to tell me, like, it's time? OK. <laughs> Real fast, I wanted another dog in the strip because it was so much fun. I wanted so because I can control everything. The creator, right? I could decide who gets pregnant, who doesn't. Anyway, so the dog next door, Sarah. The gate is open. Farley goes next door, has a love romantic relationship with Sarah the dog, and puppies happen. And little Edgar comes into the Patterson household, and I now have a baby, another little fuzzy dog that will grow up, and I can have another little dog in the strip. Well, I got letters from all these people saying, you should have had that dog neutered. How dare you have all these illegitimate puppies coming out and, you know, you should go rescue a dog. That was a deep, blah, blah, blah. And I said, lady, it's a paper dog, you know? <laughs> Anyways, so I've always listened to my readers and thank goodness they've listened to me. It's been 40 years of wonderful, wonderful work and mostly it's the relationships that I've had. I've met so many great people. I mean, when you think you're, you're done and, and forgotten and you've got a show at, uh, at the Canadian Embassy, it wakes you up and realizes that you're still plugged in, you're still, you're still full of energy, and you're still being read and enjoyed. And I sure appreciate you coming here today, because we are connected in so many ways. Thank you.